grace to all this morning and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. It's a, it's a nice place, isn't it? People come into the sanctuary and they, uh, if it's their first time, they'll often tell me how, how warm and, and, and comfortable it feels. And, and whenever I'm in here and I, I look at the sanctuary, it reminds me of those generations of the faithful, only a few generations, not, we're not talking centuries, but the generations of the faithful who have gone before us and, and had a vision for this place. The warmth of the wood, the, the uniqueness of our, of our altar screen, the different touches that change throughout the year. And I, I, I come here to worship with you all on a Sunday morning, and I think, about, I think about the life experiences that have kind of soaked themselves into the structure of this place. The baptisms and weddings and funerals that have taken place here. It's a nice place. One of my, um, I have to confess to you, one of my fears being the department, fire department chaplain here in Cousinville is that one of these days the page is going to go off and the address will come across 197 Manville Road. And my heart will sink. Now, thank God, I'm not going to knock wood, that's superstitious. I'm just going to thank God that that hasn't happened. And I pray to God it will not. But what would that mean? What would that mean? The incident that happens at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry in John's Gospel, here the second thing actually that happens, first the changing of water into wine at the wedding at Cana, but now this experience of Jesus going to Jerusalem and going into the temple and cleaning the place out because he's offended and righteously angry at the fact that the people there have changed this holy place into a marketplace is a revolutionary text. Not just for the people of Jesus' time, but for us today. It's a text, it's a passage, it's a story that calls for us to reorient ourselves to what is meaningful and important and actually crucial. It all started with a tent. The people of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and they wanted a place, something that they could identify as the meeting place between God and themselves. They wanted a place, so God gave Moses instructions, along with these other instructions that we heard Rebecca read this morning, for building of a place, a tent, where they could meet God and enact the proper sacrifices to give evidence of their witness for God. Eventually, as the Israelites became settled in their own country, the tent became transformed into a temple. And when that was destroyed, another temple and then another. Until the time of Jesus when the temple was absolutely, by all accounts, magnificent. Because for the king of Israel at that time, Herod the Great, it was a mark of pride in his status to build a temple that would be the most magnificent building around. And apparently he accomplished that. For the people of God, who went to that temple to continue the practice of sacrifice and to find it as a meeting place for God, it filled them with pride. <coughs> but that pride, as so often in our lives, was misplaced. You see, the problem was that when you have a place, you can often equate that place with the reality that's meant to reflect. So there in the temple was where God lived. And even here in this wonderful sanctuary, we call it God's house. So Jesus, in his ministry to awaken people to the reality of God's presence, went in and cleansed the temple. Because the people had focused on the wrong thing had misplaced their loyalty and trust and faith. About 40 years after this experience in the temple with Jesus and his disciples and his challenge of the authorities, about 40 years later, that very temple in which this story takes place will be destroyed by the Romans. Destroyed. 
torn down, all the articles of worship removed, the priests exiled from Jerusalem along with a great deal of the population. In 40 short years, one generation, everything that so many people held on to as a mark of God's favor for them and relationship with them was destroyed. It was like the chaplain for the Jerusalem Fire Department got the call and came to find nothing left. An absolutely revolutionary text, sisters and brothers. But you already know the punchline, don't you? It's not the place. It was never the place. Even from the very beginning, when God said, okay, you can build a tent where you'll worship me and take that tent with you, God said, it's just where my name will dwell, not me. And then when that magnificent is temple, temple is first built by Solomon, you know what they called it? They called it God's footstool. Just where God would rest God's feet, thinking in human terms. And when Isaiah has his vision of God in the temple, guess how much of God fits in the temple? Just the hem of God's robe. So magnificent is God that God cannot be contained in a place that small, that insignificant. I would hate for anything to happen to this place. But the reality is, in light of these words of Jesus, that it wouldn't really matter because the church would go on. Did you catch that sort of Almost a snarky comment that he makes when he says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it. And they're all thinking, you know, it's been 46 years. It's been one of those long building programs that's been going on and on and on. And we thought it would never come to its conclusion. And you're going to rebuild this place in three days. And they probably looked at him and if they knew anything of his reputation, they said, come on, buddy, you're just a measly little carpenter. You're not even a bricklayer. Give us a break. But did you notice how Jesus shifted the focus in that confrontation with the temple authorities from place to person himself? See, the disciples have an aha experience later on. They remember he said this, and apparently at the time when he says destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it again, they too are thinking of the magnificent building in which they're having this awkward and embarrassing and, and unsettling conversation. But then once the resurrection takes place, it all begins to make sense. Destroy this temple. And in three days, Jesus says, I will raise it again. And in that one sentence, Jesus totally changes the focus of where God can be found from a building to a person. From the coldness of wood and stone to the warmth of flesh and bone. You will not find God in any place, Jesus says. My Father doesn't choose to dwell in all of God's divine fullness in any building God chooses to dwell in divine fullness right here in me, he says. Don't look there, look right here. If you would understand who God is and what God wants from you and how God feels about you. It's not in a place. It's always in a person. We still love the place. But we love the people more. I imagine that if something were to happen to this building, we would find a way to gather again as the people of God, and the church would be totally intact. Every single stone in place as God's people. But not independent of our relationship for us as Christians with Jesus. 
And I think that's the crucial turning point in this interchange between Jesus and the temple authorities. It's in a person who then shares that grace and love with the world so that we might in our own time and place share that grace and love with the world. But what Paul clearly tells us in the reading that we heard this morning is that you don't share that grace and love in the world independent of your relationship with Jesus. If you're not, in other words, immersing yourself in that reality, you will really have nothing to give. You could do your best, it won't last. But if you tap into the power of Jesus in your life, then the potential is infinite. Okay, I'll admit, I don't feel that every day. Do you? When challenges come your way, when things don't go the way you hoped that they would, when losses come, or the world around you seems absolutely chaotic and out of control, maybe the last thing you're feeling is an infinity of power. When simple things happen and it's just one thing after another, even if they're little things, after a while, maybe all your resolve and all your Lenten discipline and all your resolution goes right out the window because, for goodness sake, this is enough. Marion and I have a friend whose mother is somewhat pessimistic and has unfortunately gotten to the place where she feels sorry for herself. Our friend told us about an experience where she was waiting for the van to come pick her up to go shopping and as she was waiting in her garage, she inadvertently knocked a jar, a glass jar of nails off the shelf and it shattered on the floor and scattered nails all over the floor of the garage. And her reaction was, why does this stuff always happen to me? And if you have perspective on that, you're thinking it's a jar of nails. But that jar of nails becomes symbolic, not just of a jar of nails, but of, of life's struggles and, and frustrations and tragedies that cause us to give up and wonder what the heck is going on. Those nails scattered on the floor become symbolic of so much of life that just gets shattered and scattered at our feet. And when we look at it, we're helpless to put it all back together. And maybe when those things happen to you, maybe it's just something simple like that. You kind of Lose your energy. Lose your spirit. It's because those things are going to totally take our attention away from the grace that is all around us. Those little things that don't quite work the way we planned or intended or cause us more work, more frustration, more anxiety, totally take our focus away from the fact that we are deeply and solidly grounded in the love of God every day of our lives. And that a broken jar of nails doesn't change that. It's a matter of perspective and practice. You can look at the things that happen to you in your life as just another example of the fact that Nobody cares about you. You're not good enough. Try as hard as you can. It's never going to work. This world is a mess, and it's just, just on its way to disaster, and there's nothing you can do about that. Or you can look at those opportunities as experiences of the potential for grace, where God invested and in living in you, in you, can make a bold and dramatic difference. And you may never know what that was. You may never see the results. But the affirmation in this confrontation between Jesus and the temple authorities is that God is not most powerfully found in buildings or places, 
But God is most powerfully found in you through Jesus. There's this uh, phrase in Celtic spirituality um, called thin places. And those are places in the world where we feel the nearness of God. And apparently the Celtic people felt them all over, all over their islands and the places where they lived. Um, you can think of places like that. Stonehenge is such a thin place where there's something mysterious and powerful about that place. They're called thin places where the boundary between life as we know it and the presence of God, the presence of the mysterious, the infinity of the divine is just that close. If you take anything with you this morning as a result of being present here in worship, please take this, that you are that thin place. You are the place in this world where the intersecting point between God and humanity comes very, very close together and touches with an infinite electric power. Even when you're not feeling it. Even when everything seems to be working to the contrary. See, that's what Paul's trying to get his listeners to understand. It's almost like if you were to distill his message, what he's saying is, of course it doesn't make sense, but that's how God works. Not always comprehended by the head, but apprehended by the heart. And sometimes the key, maybe especially a reminder to us during this Lenten season, the key, believe it or not, believe it or not, sisters and brothers who are very focused on our jobs and our responsibilities, the key is not to try harder, but to try less. Remember Paul's words, foolishness, right? Not to take those Ten Commandments as a checklist to get through every day, but to take them as another example of God's covenant with God's people to help us live in relationship that brings with it forgiveness and grace and hope. And just, just maybe a lightness of being that doesn't take ourselves so seriously, but takes our responsibility and our relationship as the very defining presence of who we are. To be that thin place not because we try so hard to be thin, but because we allow God to work through us in our vulnerability, in our surrender, in those struggles and frustrations and tragedies to keep focused on the fact that God is still a reality. To look at that broken jar of nails on the floor and say, this is a reminder, a challenge, or better, an opportunity to find some way to be thankful for all that we have and all that we are, to surrender, trusting in that infinite love of God that makes for us a way forward. Destroy this temple. Jesus says, and in three days, I will raise it up again. And that's the business that Jesus is in. The business of raising up, of building, of creating new life. Of building not places, but people. Of building not wood and stone, but flesh and bone. Of giving us that promise and hope of life now that we might be the thin, the thin place where others might recognize and celebrate the presence of God. The church is not the place. The church is and always will be the people. You. And what would be more devastating to me than the destruction of this place would be the destruction of this community. But we are gathered by the Spirit, blessed 
in bread and wine to be God's people here and now. Each one of you, a gift of grace, a thin place where God continues to enter into the world.